So I'm uh, Nicolas Bornois again of Capital Inc. Uh, and uh, I would like to welcome you to our first Sweep Owner panel for, uh, for the day. After uh, a, a very insightful introduction by uh, Graham Henderson and Michael Parker, now we're coming to uh, the first Sweep Owner panel that is going to discuss about setting the stage for the discussion that is going to, uh, to follow. Uh, so we would like to hear the Sweep Owner perspective of where we are today and how we move forward. As I mentioned, one of the differentiating factors of our forum is the very significant uh, Sweep Owner engagement. At the end of the day, Sweep Owners are those who are implementing everything that has to do with decarbonization or anything else in the industry. So I will turn it over to John McDonald from uh, ABS. Uh, I would like to thank the speakers for being with us. Uh, John, the floor is yours. I will let you introduce everybody. And again, thank you so much for being with us. Great. Thank you, Nicholas. And <clears throat> thank you, everyone, for uh, having us today. And, and welcome to the Ship Owners Perspective panel. Uh, my name is John McDonald. I'll be moderating today. I'm, I'm the head of business development for ABS. Uh, and I'd like to just start by saying a few words and setting the scene for today's panel. As many of you guys uh, are all aware, IMO has just introduced a strategy for decarbonization, creating two important milestones. First, the shipping industry will have to reduce its carbon intensity by 40% in 2030. And then in 2050, it will have to reduce even further to 70% compared to 2008. Decarbonization is one of the biggest challenges of our generation. Addressing it and standing up the challenges required a mix of solutions from operational measures to alternative fuels to the adoption of energy efficiency technologies with the biggest con contribution, which is gonna come from alternative fuels. The pressures that are gonna arise from the call to decarbonization of our industry are creating an emergency landscape of requirements that do not only have a re regulatory aspect. And that's where we're gonna come in with the discussion with our ship owners to, to address these challenges. And also by the 1st of January, 2023, EXI will be applied in the form of a technical filter that vessels will have to go through. If they don't meet this requirement, they'll have to explore options that will render them compliant. In most cases, the compliance will be achieved through applications of engine power limitation, but other options, including retrofitting with energy efficiency technologies or change to low carbon fuel will be needed. So considering the above, ABS has acknowledged the need to support our industry and achieve its sustainability goals. And with that, today's panel, we're going to discuss that with our highly experienced industry leaders that will provide unique insights on how this emerging landscape of decarbonization requirements will affect shipping. We will discuss possible solutions and explore the opportunities that this new shipping area era will bring. So let me introduce our panel. We've got Mr. Mark O'Neill, President of Columbia Ship Management, Ms. Iona Procopio, Chief Executive Officer of Prominence Maritime, Hamish Norton, President of Starbolt Carriers, Mr. Jakob Melgard, CEO of TORM, and William Faircloud, Managing Director of Wong Kwong Maritime Holdings. Good morning to you all. So what I'd like to do is start uh, our discussion around the drivers for industry change. And I'll put this out to all of you, but let's start with Iona. Uh, how effective can voluntary initiatives such as Poseidon principles and sea cargo charters and pressures from industry partners such as charters, finances, and end users be? Also, what influences does the end consumer, the general public uh, in general have? Good morning, yeah. everyone. Good morning, everyone. And Nicholas, thank you for hosting and organizing this interesting panel. Um, this is indeed a very interesting question uh, that uh, you, you're asking, John. Um, I think that the, one of the most important things to ask ourselves when um, we are suggesting environmental measures should be it's clear and an, an environmental benefit. And this must be clear and proven impact. Uh, talking about all of these initiatives, these are great initiatives. I, I'm sure everyone knows about them, but you know, getting to zero coalition has more than 140 companies from different sectors. And what they're trying to do is find a viable zero emission vessels by 2030. Um, then going on to the Poseidon principles that you mentioned, 
it is again another initiative where the um, the carbon intensity of each bank will be assessed uh, and compared to the cl climate alignment that they are they are having and the sea cargo charters as well is the signatories of that which are mainly charters or people that charter in and charter out ships it will calculate the climate alignment of the chartering activities relatively to their established uh, decarbonization trajectories. Now, going to, to the second part of what you're, you're asking, which is who should be um, paying for all of this, I, need, I think we need to, to set the stage by saying that the decarbonization of the shipping industry is going to take uh, more than 1.8 trillion and uh, even though waterborne transportation has been proven to be the most environmentally friendly mode of transport, uh, um, we still do have to reduce our carbon footprint, according to IMO, by 50% uh, until the 2050, 2050. So what we would like in this new uh, uh, the decarbonization world is for shipping to function as it does today, with ships moving at uh, adequate speeds, consistently with viable uh, economics to support the customer's supply chain and the global trade uh, as, 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 as we know it. Unfortunately, today we don't have a clear path so to make this happen. Um, now, when we're looking at uh, a regulation, a regulation is good when we see, when we look at it through the whole life cycle analysis. So when we're talking about regulations, we should consider from the extraction of the fuel, for example, or from the raw materials for manufacturing any um, engine or any ship, etc., until the, uh, the the grave uh, of this, until the the total life cycle, uh, until the end of the useful life. Because otherwise, if we only look at parts of it, we're going to end up having um, a shift from land from shore-based uh, emissions sorry, from, uh, from sea-based emissions into land-based emissions. Um, but unfortunately, there's limited information from suppliers and manufacturers about the carbon footprint of uh, uh, this uh, sort of thing. Um, I think this is what is very important. Now, at the end, uh, if we're talking about an amount of 1.8 trillion, obviously this cannot be footed by the shipping industry alone. And look, hearing a bit on the previous panel, it, I, I was very happy to see that there's a lot of uh, consensus that how this uh, cost should be shared between the parties involved, from the charters to the, uh, to the uh, oil majors, to the shipyards, to, to even to the end consumer who are becoming more and more aware of the carbon footprint their actions are having. So I think that this sets a good stage to, to, to proceed with the decarbonization that we are discussing. Mm. That's a good point on the, on the shared responsibility. And that's something that's very key for an industry uh, disruptor such as we have with decarbonization. I mean, this is something that's responsible from, from quite honestly well to wake. Uh, and we need to make sure that the entire industry is working together on this. Uh, John, John, can I, can I, can I add there to, to sort of- um, Sure, Mark. Uh, lead into a discussion I, I think as much as we uh, the commercial world would like to congratulate itself that it, it drives change I, I think the, the the reality is that that change is driven by uh, shareholders and and be they political shareholders uh, the populations of countries and their appetites for environmental on environmental issues and for environmental change or commercial shareholders and the uh, political shareholders will normally drive the change through regulation and then the commercial shareholders will follow that regulation and and the, the regulation is the driver because let's face it the reality is commercial organizations are there to make profits and uh, unless there is a regulation forcing them to do something and incur perhaps sometimes additional costs uh, they won't make the change. They will stick with the existing status quo. So I think that the, the, the change that we're seeing is being driven by shareholder and share value, be it in political votes or in, in, in commercial shares. And I think the, the, the post-COVID, after any crisis, uh, any world crisis, huge forces 
are uh, released. Sometimes they're positive, uh, sometimes they're negative, and decisions are taken, new world orders are, are established. If you look at the UK, I, I, I was thinking back before this um, panel, if you look at the, the UK after the Second World War, some of the, the fantastic social change that took place, the formation of the National Health Service, all the social welfare uh, regulations arose post that crisis because you have a, a clean slate to uh, to work with and an appetite to work with. So I think we're going to see uh, that shareholder driven change, political and commercially, really accelerate as we come out of this um, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Hmm. That's, that's actually just, a very good point. I think that's a good point, uh, Mark, that, that it is driven by outside forces. However, what, what I think is also a little interesting is that um, this about regulatory or voluntary, I think the credibility for our ecosystem about actually bringing real proposals that do change uh, uh, the nature of our industry and work towards decarbonization, that is something that I expect more of. I, I, will, I, I honestly see that there is a lot of actors in this ecosystem that wants to be on the journey and of course driven by what you're saying there's a that there is a profit motive at the end of the day so ultimately the credibility that we as an industry create for ourselves by bringing live proposals like whether it's the getting to zero the poseidon principles whether it's in imo also coming up with real solutions to real problems like for instance when you had to introduce a carriage ban for non-compliant fuels. That was actually the industry coming up with a solution that was then uh, taken by regulators and, uh, and being implemented. So I think we'll see a lot of implementation, but I think that the industry has a unique opportunity to actually influence on, uh, on this also with the track record that we have with the credibility. And yes, uh, we are all challenged uh, by that regulators at certain times either too slow or that they don't have the fun, uh, fundamental knowledge to make the right decisions. However, I think that from where I, I sit, at least, I can see that we all have a, have a unique opportunity at this sort of crossroad to actually be influencing on it and to then share the responsibility uh, also by having the regulatory forces uh, going in, 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 at least in the right direction. We cannot regulate but we can influence. And I think that's a, that's a unique opportunity, actually. Uh, Jacob, that, that's a great point in that in the ecosystem that we have today with decarbonization, there's so many uh, uh, influences from different parts of our whole ecosystem, which is kind of unique in that we haven't had that uh, you know, in, in a lot of the other regulations that do come up. Uh, and there's so much uh, that is, that's being handled from all different aspects today and, and being discussed that there's a, a big force to shape and change uh, and, and bring those influences in when it gets to that regulation, as you mentioned. Well, everything, everything is kind of broken uh, after COVID-19 and it's a great opportunity coming back to the, 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 the clean slate. It's a great opportunity to change. I had uh, our chairman come into my office just by way of example yesterday morning and throw uh, all the plastic cups that were in the coffee uh, room within our organization on, on, on my desk and say, never again. I don't want to see any more plastic cups. Now, that in itself is an engagement and a change uh, that previously didn't exist. You know, we are, we've all had time to think about what's important. And the, uh, whereas before the Greta Thunbergs of this world would be an interesting sideshow, all of a sudden now they're really core to what we're about and what our people are about and what our business is about. And uh, it was a very graphic example to me of this engagement and these forces that will be released because I wasn't sure four or five months ago, uh, pre-US election result, whether post-COVID we would have the same drive for decarbonization and environmental issues as we had pre, whether it would build up or whether it would decrease as economies try to rebuild build but i'm firmly of the belief now that the the uh, the 2050 um uh, deadline is perhaps further out than it's actually going to be i think that's going to uh, the, the public opinion world public opinion is going to drive that uh, drive that end date much much nearer and we're going to have to take strategic decisions very much more quickly than we perhaps would with the 2050 uh, stop date 
Mm. I think one other thing I would just add is, is we need to take a broader view of sustainability. I think that's rapidly becoming part of the conversation. It's biodiversity. It's not just decarbonization. And we need to make sure it's really an international approach. I think that's one of the advantages shipping has is we are truly an international business. I think on this panel, John, it's four in the morning for you in Houston. But I mean, I'm, I'm not really in Hong Kong at the moment, but I'm representing, you know, more sort of the Asian market. And we need to make sure it's easy to get lost in regulations. I know the European regulations are obviously pushing ahead and, and it needs to be an international um, answer. And, and it's really a broad challenge over the next decade to how we, you know, decarbonize and make the whole yeah. supply chain more sustainable. And we need to really think in those terms. Sure, sure. Uh, and, and one point to that uh, is that uh, when you look at this kind of global effort, is uh, there, there's a lot of different regulations, a lot of different initiatives, uh, and we want to make sure that we get that right. And it's a, it's a, uh, we go forward as uh, together, and we you know we have a lot of uh, uh, different initiatives from a regional standpoint. So, for example, you've got the uh, EU ETS which is a regional measure, with China also considering its own regional measures and possibly U.S. in the future. Uh, so what do you all see following on these developments? I mean, how can an operator keep track of all these possible reporting lines, uh, all these different regional measures, and, and how do you see that playing out uh, as this kind of moves forward? And uh, Hamish, maybe I'll start with you. I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. Yes, oh, I'm off go. mute there. Yeah, no, uh, sh shipping companies are, are going to have to be very large to uh, to deal with these uh, regulations on a regional basis. In order to be alliance departments, uh, shipping companies are going to start having to employ uh, people who are full-time uh, devoted to figuring out how to comply with regulations, just like banks. And um, you know, just as banks needed to grow large in order to be able to comply with all the regulations they have to comply with, shipping companies are going to have to be large. And um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's frankly one of the benefits of, of uh, being at Star Bulk is that we have a pretty large company, although I, I don't know that we're necessarily large enough. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Sorry to be controversial. I'm not sure you have to be large. I think you have to be nimble and flexible. And uh, I think some of the the companies that fared the best during the crew rotation uh, crisis were those companies that. Um, uh, were uh, had a different approach and were looking forward rather than just approaching our business on joining the dots and getting cargo uh, or and vessel from point A to point B, uh, considering all of the possible what ifs. What if uh, we can't rotate rotate our crews in in the Philippines? What if we can't uh, rotate our crews in, in in Singapore? And I think it's it, for the most part uh, the shipping industry weathered. Uh, big or big or small uh, operators weathered uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic extremely well as a uh, as a sector because we we are used to tacking with the winds whichever whichever direction they come from and uh, looking forward so I don't think size size also brings with it uh, an inflexibility and a lack of agility um, but I think it's an approach which we as an industry uh, have in abundance from from my limited experience. I mean, I, I would agree. I don't think size is that important and critical. I, I think it's a digital challenge that we have. I think the next 10 years is about, uh, in order to really understand what we've got to do, it's going back to Iana's point right at the beginning is there are many different things, pieces of information we don't have access to. It's difficult to understand what the correct course of action is that we need to take on a holistic view. And that really is because we, you know, once you measure it, you can manage it. And, we, you know, we, there's so many things we need to measure. And that's a digital problem for the whole supply chain. And shipping needs to make sure that we are, you know, sitting in the middle of that supply chain. And as, as Joanna said, from the raw materials through to the finished products, we're, we're, we're at the heart of that. And we need a digital approach to understanding 
what the best course of action is in uh, you know and each case is different and and i don't think that's necessarily a size thing it's you know digital efficiency i think that is what we're, we're embarking on now there are many digital tools we need to we, we need to start to use and they need to be able to talk up and down the supply chain and so we can actually really understand what the most efficient behavior is um in order to get to this goal that we're all sort of agreed we need to get to yeah but, but going but like going the, oh sorry go ahead Daniel. I mean, going back to the EU ETS, which is a quasi-regional measure, what, but will have a far-reaching effect because they're still de debating whether it's going to be intra-EU or it's going to uh, involve ships starting from outside the EU and uh, finishing in an EU port and vice versa. I think this might end up being an impediment to decarbonization because if we have different states, like John mentioned, China considering doing the same, I think this is only going to serve as a, as a deterrent to, to an uh, international, uh, like an IMO regulation that would uh, include all of this. So if you have different global, uh, local regulations, it, it might even um, make decarbonization uh, take longer than it would if it, there was just one regulation that we all have to, to comply with that is uh, reaching the globe where, where shipping actually uh, uh, is a global industry. And uh, I, I think that the, the whole notion of uh, regional measures needs to be um, rethought when it comes to this. Um, and this is my, my thought on, on the EU ETS. And also one other thing we need to bear in mind, if let's say there's a price of uh, $25 per, per CO2 ton, uh, given the MRV uh, numbers for 2008, 18, we're talking about 3.4, 45 billion dollars so this is a huge amount how is this money uh, going to be used and this gives a rise to okay we're paying but we shouldn't be shouldn't be paying in order to be allowed to pollute we should be paying in order to find a solution and i think these are these are issues that need to be addressed when proposing measures that are for decarbonization as well yeah I, and <laughs> You know, just just you know, talking about the the EU ETS. I don't know. No one knows how they'll handle shipping, but when they've you know uh, had ETS regimes for land-based industries and aviation, they have given free credits to existing players. But who are the existing players in shipping? Who will get the free credits? It's a very complex. Uh, and dangerous situation, actually. And, and also, I think when that, they, oh, sorry. go ahead. But I agree, Amy, that it is, it is complex, but I think that it, it, it will be a fact that the EU Commission this summer will come up with at least their take on how we as an industry should be governed in the European, uh, in the pure European scheme. So again, Coming back to my point, at least as being chairman of Danish Shipping, what we are doing is influencing uh, factually politicians around what is it that is then the right way forward. Because to say uh, simply not come up with solutions, just say we don't like it, I don't think it's going to bring us anywhere as an industry. I think this credibility around actually having a voice, whether it's in, within the EU or whether it's IMO, that's the important uh, thing. And yes, there are many... It's, it's not a, a flower that, uh, that any of us would like in our garden, but it's a fact it's going to come. So we, we better uh, influence and prepare ourselves uh, in the best way with all the caveats. And I think this part around that the burden is, should be spread out and, and that uh, the whole ecosystem, including, of course, the customer base, will be part of it. And I think politically, there's a drive to that that is understood also by the stakeholders that are the, on the client side, because they are part of the same political pressures as ourselves to demonstrate the willingness around decarbonization at the end of the day. So yeah. I'm relatively positive that we can influence and that we can create systems that uh, will make sense, but we cannot do it by just hammering away and saying it doesn't work to have it because I think politically it's a fact that it's going to come. Jakob, do you really think, and, and, and we discussed this briefly, didn't we, uh, last week, do you really think shipping can influence such big 
uh, issues as uh, decarbonization. Uh, the, one of the wonderful things I think about shipping is that that uh, we we imagine ourselves to be uh, the centre about which everything else turns, and it's a wonderfully romantic industry. When why why should shipping be more interesting than uh, rail haulage or or, or road haulage? Uh, but it has this romance, and we 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 consider ourselves to be uh, perhaps more important in the overall logistics chain than we are. Uh, I think these decisions, and 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 funnily enough, we uh, uh, we were talking to the IMO uh, only yesterday as part of Intermanager, um, which 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 we're part of, and and it struck me then how limited, first of all, how limited organizations, NGOs such as Intermanager, Intercargo are, and secondly, how limited a voice uh, organizations such as the IMO. Uh, is where they have to work in coordination with so many other organizations. Uh, and actually, if they achieve a listening purpose, if they at least give us some forewarning of what is coming, that's probably the most uh, we can expect. Because if you look at IMO 2020, the, the industry's criticism there was that we didn't have enough influence. Uh, shipping wasn't taken into account uh, on, uh, on sulfur content as much as perhaps it should be the practical steps. Uh, but we, we had notice and we perhaps should have taken better uh, action in respect of that notice. All we can do is plan for the future, I think. I don't think shipping is going to really change the price of eggs, or as we say in England, uh, or, or, or the actual outcome of overall worldwide decarbonization environmental issues. I, 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 I yeah. just don't buy that. I think we, what the best we can hope for is sufficient notice to plan our asset investment and our flexibility and, and uh, proceed accordingly. Yeah, Let me just I, give a word on that, Mark, that, that uh, absolutely that uh, the train is, uh, is going in a direction where the tracks are already laid. But I think the rules of the game is something that we can actually influence on. I've seen that in numerous cases where the industry, when it uh, is taking a credible role, it is taken serious, our voice is taken serious, it doesn't change the fact about sort of the track and uh, where it's going, but the pace and also the rules of the game, the distribution of how uh, the cost involved, etc., will be. I actually am a firm believer in that uh, the shipping industry has a voice in that area, not in, at the global scene, uh, as you point to. But that's not the point. We all actually want to achieve decarbonization, but then we want to achieve it based upon facts and based upon the best solutions not only for the industry, of course, but also uh, for the greater good. So I, I would subscribe to that. Yes, we are small, efficient, but much bigger uh, play, but we can actually influence. I, I hope you're right and I'm wrong. <laughs> well, I, 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 I agree think with talking, that. Yeah, I think, I think you're, you're sort of talking past each other in the sense that Jacob is saying that shipping can influence the rules as they apply to shipping specifically. But exactly. I think, you know, I think that it's probably correct that shipping will have great difficulty changing the overall direction of decarbonization. I, I, and, you know, I don't, I don't think that's probably shipping's role. But for shipping to influence the rules that specifically apply to shipping is, is I think, practical. Do you guys think there's a lot of greenwashing and a lot of, you know, good intentions, but at the end of the day, when it's going to come to, okay, who foots the bill, you're going to see many unwilling people to do so. And I'm not just saying about the, the ship owners, I'm talking about the whole chain of the industry, because it's all nice and uh, good to make headline rates and uh, headline uh, uh, quotes saying, you know, we believe that, yeah. <laughs> shipping is so dirty and shipping should pay so much per ton, et cetera, for their fuel and everything. But then, you know, there are no other viable solution at the moment as it stands. So it's all good and nice to say, yes, we, we, we do want to decarbonize and I think you guys should do it. But we don't have this uh, technologies right now. We don't have these options. And it's all about, you know, wish, wish wishes. 
Yeah, I, know. Yeah, I think so you, that... you've hit the nail on the head there. I mean, yeah. our only problem with decarbonisation, to the extent it's a problem, is that our whole industry, from an asset perspective, is based on a 20, 25 year lifespan. And, and that's, that's we, we go out and procure our, our, our vessels on that basis. And there is a, a lack of uh, ingenuity in the design aspect to give us the flexibility to... Uh, dual fuel or, or operate hybrid vessels or operate a multitude of different fuels or dare I say it whip out the engine uh, uh, because it's no longer it's no longer environmentally friendly and put in another power source so it's a design issue and if we had that solved if if design if the designers the maritime designers had to kick up the backside and said we need to we need assets that that are flexible and perhaps they have a shorter um, lifespan or perhaps the the propulsion has a shorter lifespan and we can we can uh, um, swap and change and integrate as we see fit then that is the answer uh, we all want to be more environmentally friendly but we're hampered we're restricted by the nature of our assets which have a 25 year lifespan and, and a and a, perhaps a disproportionately high cost uh, so it's it, i think design gives us the flexibility to comply and i think we're going to have yeah. to address that pretty quickly because i think changes oh, will be oh. much more quick yeah mark that that's uh, a great segue into and in kind of the second part of what i'd like to go over uh, over this panel is is really around the elements around decarbonization that focus around that operational side, uh, the ener energy efficiency technologies that are being looked at today, and, and then those alternate fuels. And, and uh, how do you all see that those, <clears throat> those uh, three areas are, are affecting the shipping today? And, and how do you see it uh, for the future? I mean, do we have the designs that are being worked on today? I mean, from a class standpoint, I know that we're working on this uh, as a top priority with uh, industry players uh, across the globe. Uh, with shipyards, uh, again, a joint uh, industry initiatives that, that are going uh, globally. How do you see uh, it, in, in this panel, give us your insight into how you see that working today. Is, is the operational uh, optimization that, that uh, is affecting you know, the shipping today, is that the answer for the short term? Uh, and how do you see the, the energy efficiency and, and alternate fuels that are for the future, the mid and long term? affecting our designs and shipping. Mark, I'll let you kind of run off on that if you well, I, I probably I probably said enough already. I, I, I personally um uh, I, I personally think we need greater flexibility as I touched on on before. Mm -hmm. You know, we have uh uh, robots crawling the the surface of Mars, sending photos back to us, and yet we 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 have still not over the last um, twenty years that I've been involved in, or twenty five years that I've been involved in shipping, come up with a uh, a more uh, practical, economically viable, technologically flexible solution to uh, shorten the asset life, reduce the cost and give more flexibility on propulsion. And, and uh, I think the answers are out there. But again, I think it is this shareholder, political and commercial shareholder uh, stock that will drive uh, through this change, because we certainly need it. That is the only restriction on, on us all uh, warmly hugging and embracing the environmental changes and decarbonization, et cetera, that are, that are coming. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, the, the, the way I see it, um, you know, s s slowing down the fleet has, you know, a, a, an effect of, you know, 20 to 40 percent, maybe at the outside limit. Um, route and speed optimization, you know, better paint, uh, Mevis ducts and other sorts of ducts, gate rudders, you know, maybe is another 15%. Um, but then it's, it's uh, you know, zero carbon fuels. And, uh, you know, the only way to get zero carbon fuels adopted uh, is, is basically to make it profitable, uh, which essentially involves uh, a, a carbon tax of quite a substantial amount in order to incentivize people to, for example, use ammonia. Uh, you know, ammonia will have to be cheaper, net-net. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that's frankly why I agree with the sentiment that others have expressed, that it, this will happen before 2050, because as soon as you get 
a sufficiently large carbon tax, the whole industry will switch over as fast as it can. Yeah, Hamish, sure uh, you, 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 uh, you, you brought up in our, in our warm-up discussion, you brought up a good point that uh, uh, you, know, you can't just look at the fuel uh, being burnt when you look at the whole carbon footprint. You have to look at the process in constructing uh, the bulker or the tanker or the container ship, which I thought was, uh, was an excellent point. And I think uh, you know, world opinion uh, is getting more sophisticated and educated all the time on mm -hmm. that overall picture. And I think it mm -hmm. won't just be enough for us as operators, uh, as owners to say, oh, look at the fuel we're burning, when actually to build one of these uh, behemoths, uh, your carbon footprint uh, perhaps far exceeds the net gain or the net benefit of the first five years. I can't remember the point you much more well, eloquently well, than I put. Well, well, I mean, my, my, my point was that, you know, uh, building a new ship uses about as much carbon as the operation of that ship, at least with current fuels, over one and a half to two years. So that if, if you build a ship that uses only a slightly more efficient fuel like LNG, uh, that saves you perhaps 20% of the carbon emissions, it's seven or eight years before you've broken even on the carbon emissions. Uh, and, and by that time, you know, I think ammonia fueled ships will possibly be available. And so, uh, you know, my point was, is, is it worth, you know, trying to nurse the existing fleet along for a few years until an actual zero carbon fuel like ammonia becomes available or, or even for the largest ships nuclear? Amish, to, to that point, uh, the, the dominant fuel today, uh, when we're looking at dual fuel and uh, in that kind of transition fuel is, is LNG. Uh, what do you see as a, kind of a, an alternate fuel that's going to be dominant if, if there is one? Or, or will there still remain kind of that variety of fuels in the, in the alternate, alternate fuel space? Um, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping there will be a dominant fuel <laughs> because if there are multiple fuels uh, to choose from, um, it becomes so easy to make the wrong choice. And if you make the wrong choice and the price of the different fuels diverges, then you can very quickly have a stranded asset that does, does you and no one else any good. Um, so I'm expecting the industry to converge on you know, a dominant fuel um, simply because that's the only way to be sure that people are making the right choice. And I think also it's a matter of infrastructure for the for which fuel is going to be, if we have a one fuel rather than a, a combination of fuels, which was uh, also being discussed in the earlier panel, that there will be a combination of fuels rather than one. I think it's a matter of infrastructure because if you think about it, the LNG the to have uh, bunkering infrastructure for LNG, um, it has taken over forty years. So now we're talking about finding the zero zero emissions fuel and then constructing the infrastructure for it. I think it's going to be, I'm not so optimistic in terms of the, of the time horizon we're talking about. Um, and also we have to bear in mind the, the, the pricing of it as well and the calorific value, all of, all of these elements um, that we discuss. And as Hamish very correctly said, there are many operational measures that are, that are very easy to implement and that they do, um, it, they can safely take us to 2030 uh, for the IMO ambition of 30% without even changing the ships or anything, just the way we operate them. And I think it's a shame going around the wrong way about it. I mean, this is, this is my opinion. Then rather than going you know, with operational measures that require no investment from ship owner's side as well, and they do yield a good environmental footprint. Um, and I, I, I think this is something that needs to be... Um, um, further assessed before we dismiss things like that. So with, with those alternative fuels, I guess the, the other challenge that we haven't really talked about is that the required knowledge of our, our uh, seafarers that will be out there. Uh, 
do you believe that there's going to be the, the sufficient people on board uh, during this transition to alternate fuels? I mean, what, what do you all see the, the major challenges around the skill sets that will become more relevant as, as we kind of do this shift from operational measures to alternate fuels and these new designs that are coming out? Uh, Jacob, do you have a kind of from your side at TORM, do you looking at that today? I would be relatively optimistic on that uh, uh, globally, the seafarers are of a high standard and that the alternate fuels, everything else being equal, is a design issue and uh, that the required competences. Of course, we don't know what, the, <laughs> what it will be at, at this stage, but I would be optimistic that we can step by step increase the competences in the light of what is uh, what is going to be sort of the chosen one. I agree with the comments uh, made that I think in the interim here, we are going to have a number of different uh, fuel types that would be the alternative fuel, predominantly the LNG, but then others are coming. And then ultimately, after, let's say, a decade of phasing, you would expect that there would be a gradually graviation towards one uh, particular uh, fuel type. And that Graviation will then also lead to that the seafarers uh, that we all have and, and are, 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 that they can also be on the same journey. But of course, it requires an uplift in competences. But I think that the industry would be ready to, uh, to take that on and to ensure that we can create quality ships with quality people. I think uh, um, the problem is going to be a, a little more than that, to be honest with you. And uh, um, you know, speaking as a, a crew manager, during COVID-19, uh, we saw uh, huge problems with uh, crew rotations, of course, uh, but also in maintaining matrix compliance in relation to our tanker fleet. We're, we're one of the largest uh, tanker managers uh, and maintaining matrix compliance is, of course, uh, uh, vital. Now, it struck me then, and, and we were only able to do it through the technology uh, uh, that was talked about uh, early in the digitalization through our control room. But when you have, um, if you take Hamish's uh, example of perhaps a, a varied fleet of nuclear powered hydrogen, ammonia, uh, LNG, dual fuel, uh, each of your seafarers is going to have to be specifically trained. Then you throw in rotations and you have any disruption to that rotation sequence, as we've seen with COVID-19, and it becomes a logistical nightmare uh, because you will have different crews at different levels of expertise, all having to satisfy different regulations, matrix compliances, etc. So it, it's going to be... Uh, I hope there is a predominant fuel uh, because otherwise uh, I agree with you, Anna, not just on the supply side, it's going to be a logistical, I wouldn't say nightmare because we, we're as an industry, we, we handle nightmares well, but a, a challenge and, and require digital um, uh, tools to enable us to properly plan and rotate. I think it, it, yeah. it, it definitely I would, going to be. I would, argue, I would argue, Mark, that that is our role in up the I think. Yeah, you know, it's our role, but we, it's, just, it's, it's not going to be easy. Started. As you say, I mean, we do the same. Uh, and yes, it is a nightmare, but it can be done. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to rest my <laughs> word on that. Yes, it's this can be done. Will there will be complexity, obviously, higher complexity. But uh, I think that, uh, as you point to, with the assistance of uh, technology, with data, etc., yes, this can also be uh, solved. I don't think it's going to be a barrier for the industry on the road to decarbonization. That, that would be my yeah. issue. But it sounds and, uh, like crew wages are going up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd like to want to go back, and, and you, you've all mentioned it uh, in one way or another during our discussion is around digital and technology and the digital tools that are needed today and that you may be implementing. I think, William, you brought it up initially. Uh, and can you maybe just uh, give me an idea of, uh, and the, to the panel as far as what what you're bringing in from a digital standpoint to kind of work through your operations around decarbonization, crewing, uh, you know, and, and the challenges that we're facing today in this this uh, changing world. 
Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges, uh, which is often overlooked, is the ships themselves are fairly analog still. I mean, the, the digitalization that we've seen is predominantly on the shore, you know, simply because connectivity on, on ships in the middle of the ocean is still relatively primitive. I mean, we're talking equivalent to sort of the Wi-Fi we enjoyed um, in, in, in Hong Kong. I was using an example in about 2004. So pre-smartphones, you know, that's the uh, sort of stable Wi-Fi connection, which is not very stable and it's more like an old dial-up. And so that limits the digitalization that can take place on board a ship. If you sort of envisage a future where every crew member effectively has a tablet and, you know, there's real-time information being fed straight back to sort of centralized, um, you, you know, processing on, on the shore. That, that actually is not happening today because... Your average, um, you know, connectivity of a ship when it's in the middle of the ocean is, is not is, that, that technology is not there. And over the next five or ten years, vessels will become fully connective in a way. What well, we hope, I think, they should do. You have sort of these low low orbit um, satellite systems going in to provide blanket broadband everywhere to the most remote parts of the world. And once ships are actually plugged in on that level, it becomes affordable. It becomes you know proper um, broad broadband then you're going to have a, a massive proliferation of information of data coming from vessels. And, and that will improve tremendously the, um, the amount of or did, make, managing the data and you know, measuring things. And, and, and I think the key going back to decarbonization and sustainability generally is, is all of these things we've talked about has to be linked through you know, a common means of measuring and tracking Carbon, if we want to focus on carbon and decarbonization through the supply chain, from building the ship to, you know, mining the iron ore or extracting the oil through to the, you know, processing of that raw material. And so that is a massive digital challenge. And in a sense, we've talked about what can we do for modes of propulsion and is it ammonia, is it LNG? And that's a big challenge. And maybe, we, you know, we can't answer that here and it's going to take maybe five years, maybe 10 years, maybe longer. But what can we do now, I think, as an industry is to really ensure that when digitalization hits the, the, the vessels in the middle of the ocean and when um, parties upstream and downstream in the supply chain want to actually start putting together a, a more sort of holistic view of what the supply chain actually emits in terms of carbon, that we are able to engage with that. So, and, you know, and I think that's what shipping needs to be able to do is, is to understand. Also, regulators are needing more and more information. The European ETS will want information. The IMO will want information. You know, regulators are going to want more and more information. And I think, you know, my, my own view is regulation will play a part, but I think the free market will also play a part, you know, the, the action of consumers and everyone else. And it all relates back to having the information and digitalization. Very good, William. And that's that's a great uh, uh, kind of final point that uh, we want to make is that with technology, with the alternate fuels, we need that uh, and and the uh, the connectivity that we'll have for the future. This will definitely play a bigger role in how we operate our vessels uh, and and the value that we get from the technology and, the, and those digital tools that we bring into play uh, will affect shipping uh, as we go forward. Um, I, I do, I do want to kind of wrap up by, uh, cause I think we, we've, uh, just gone past our time, uh, is to uh, thank you all. Uh, this was a very engaged, uh, group and, and a lot of great discussion. And, uh, I, I look forward to, uh, having further discussions with you all as we come to conclusions around, uh, the decarbonization challenge. So thank you very much. And, uh, I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. By the way, we had so many questions submitted, so I will fill the questions to you to uh, try to answer them privately. As we can tell, we had a lot of uh, engagement on this panel. Uh, by the Very way, we have, we have two more minutes left if you would like to, uh, to make any final statements. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought I was, yeah, I thought we uh, got to, told we were uh, finished. Two minutes is not that. <laughs> okay. Uh, if, if there's any any other uh, final thoughts on the uh, uh, kind of are, are we on the right track as far as the ESG from your standpoint, and uh, if any of you would like to uh, kind of give us a final view of where you stand, I, I, I'd like to uh, just very quickly, John. I'd like to say I I, I agree for the most part with what William's saying, but uh, uh, just with one qualification that uh, uh, digitalization and technology is a uh, a means 
to the end. It's not it's not the end itself. And and uh, that what matters in this industry and what will always matter is the people. Uh, so it's just simply right. a tool. And, uh, you know, whether you're inputting the data, collecting the data, reviewing the data, it's simply a tool to the optimization of the operation itself. Um, and I think that's what we've got to remember, too. I think if I may add here as well, I think we are all uh, um, we need to consider as well the role of the person that gives the uh, the, the commercial, uh, um, let's say, um, the role of the operator of the ship, which in many cases is not the ship owner. We have the charters that give us the route, the cargo, the the uh, the speed and all of this and all of this has is directly linked to uh, emissions. And I think that this is something we should not forget when we're talking about the whole chain of decarbonization. Very good point. So thank you to everybody. I think now we have reached uh, our time. Uh, again, yeah. tremendous panel setting the stage for the forum. Thank you very, very much John and to everyone. William, Hamish, Jacob, uh, Mark, and of course, Ioana. Thank you. Thanks, Nicholas. Thank Take you. care, Thanks for having Thank us. You. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.